um, bring us to order and can I welcome everyone to this, the 14th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. The first item on our agenda today is the consideration of new petitions. The first petition is Petition 1693 on Independent Water Ombudsman by Graham Harvey on behalf of the Lowland Canals Association. We will take evidence this morning from the petitioner, who is the chairman of the Lowlands Canals Association, and he is joined by Christine Cameron, who also represents the Lowlands Canals Association, and Ronnie Rusak, MBE, who is the chairman of the Lowlands Canals Volunteer Group. Can I welcome you all, and you have the opportunity to make an opening statement for up to five minutes, after which we will move to questions from the committee. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Ronnie Rusak and I uh, have some in excess of 80 years experience with Lowland Canals, uh, rating right back to the early 70s when they were in a very parlous state. Uh, we were involved in setting up a variety of different organisations and canal societies, uh, which in the initial days um, were looking after small sections of both the Union and the Forth and Clyde canals. Uh, over the years, uh, various uh, areas were built up, became major tourist attractions. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of my own area in Linlithgow with the Linlithgow Union Canal Society and the canal basin there. Um, we're getting massive support on places like TripAdvisor and all the rest of it. So over the, these years, we have been attracting a variety of tourism and various support for communities. When we started, we never ever imagined that the canals would be completely reopened as they were with the Millennium Link back in 2002. Since that time, things were initially uh, improving the terms and conditions of the funding for the Millennium Link um, included uh, the requirement that the navigations must be maintained for a minimum of 25 years from 2002. Subsequently, in 2011, the uh, Scottish Government uh, changed the categories for the remainder canals um, from remainder status to cruising status which then brought them under the remit of the Transport Act 1968, which clearly states that the waterways must be maintained uh, permanently for, you know, uh, for the future and uh, an indeterminate future period. So that superseded the 25-year the period. Unfortunately, um, since 2012, when the waterways were split up and the uh, English and Welsh uh, canals and rivers uh, were put under charity called the Canal and Rivers Trust, Scottish Government decided to keep the remainder of British waterways in Scotland and um, they were given the trading name of Scottish Canals. Part of the remit for the funding was that British Waterways, now Scottish Canals, um, should encourage the regeneration across central Scotland, which has been extremely successful. Um, several thousand jobs have been created. Uh, I think over 5,000 houses have been built along the line of the canal um, and several other businesses. Sadly, because of the lack of um, maintenance by Scottish canals, uh, we're now in a state where several areas of the canals are rapidly going back to the poor state they were in in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, because of lack of maintenance, lack of dredging, lack of weed cutting, um, plus, of course, uh, as some of you may know, two major bridges on the Forth and Clyde Canal uh, have been closed uh, for safety reasons. Um, it's a bit annoying to some of us, bearing in mind that the Forth and Clyde Canal is 250 years old and some of their bridges that are 250 years old are still in great working condition, whereas brand new bridges built for the Millennium Link are in a state of collapse. 
uh, through lack of maintenance. Over the uh, ensuing period, um, we have become greatly concerned about uh, the management of Scottish canals using the any profits that they have from property, etc., into regeneration projects rather than the maintenance of the waterways. Uh, while it's fine um, encouraging regeneration across central Scotland, which we're all heavily supportive of, nowhere in their remit does it say that they should become actively involved in being a regeneration company, uh, which they have subsequently done uh, with an organisation called BIGG Regeneration, which was set up uh, around about 2012. Um, this regeneration company is now involved in building houses uh, and various other projects um, and it's also been noticed that they've been hoovering up lots of grant aid, um, including £237,000 in Fort Augustus from the Coastal Regeneration Fund uh, for a property that they bought in Fort Augustus. We have, on numerous occasions, uh, gone through Scottish Canal's complaints procedure, been dissatisfied with the uh, responses and have submitted applications to the SPSO or sorry SPOS unfortunately the attitude that we've had back from there is that they will only deal with matters of maladministration um, and it clearly says in their remit they should deal with matters of maladministration or matters that seriously affect um, customers uh, that they have declined to do on a numerous occasions when uh, we have put complaints in regarding their uh, activities. When, in 2012, the waterways were split up in England and Wales, they were allocated an independent ombudsman to look after all the waterways. So that's canals, rivers and... Uh, other inland waterways. This is what we would like to see in Scotland because this is what we don't have. We need an independent uh, overview um, so that we can uh, take our issues to that independent overview. Um, the other problems that we do have is while we follow Scottish Canal's complaints procedure, it is extremely difficult to find anybody that can deal with complaints against senior management because they're the ones that are looking after um, the, the complaints and making decisions. So we, on occasions we found ourselves between a rock and a hard place. We can't complain um, or create any uh, interest in things that are being controlled by senior management because we've got nobody to go to to complain about them. Or, I mean, you know, complain is probably a correct word to use in some occasions, but there are other occasions where we need, you know, an independent review of what is uh, being done. Uh, much uh, money has been spent by them on regeneration projects, as I said earlier on. Tragically, the money has not been spent on their statutory duties, which is to maintain the waterways. Uh, we're in the situation, for example, on the Forth and Clyde Canal, of two major bridges, two major road bridges being closed. Um, there are several other bridges also affected. Uh, lack of dredging. Uh, there was complaints by Scottish Canals that you know, the, the number of yachts transiting Scotland. And the Forth and Clyde Canal is the oldest sea to sea crossing in the world. Uh, and, you know, therefore a major tourist attraction uh, on its own. Um, the yacht numbers for transit dropped drastically because of the lack of dredging. And on one occasion when this was pointed out to the chairman, 
that their literature stated that the navigation depth was 1.8 metres, um, but that was no longer the case. His response to that was, oh, well, we better look at changing our literature then. Uh, as you can imagine, that sort of response that we were getting was not acceptable and extremely worrying. We, we are all heavily involved in various different organisations and groups. Um, and most of the subgroups, like my own, the Lowland Canals Association, uh, Scottish Volunteers, uh, Canal Volunteer Group, we are now part of an umbrella body called Keep Canals Alive, which has other major members, including RYA Scotland, uh, Fourth Yachts Association, uh, because while initially we were looking at uh, someone to look after the interests of canals uh, and waterways, we rapidly came to realise that there are so many other boat users that need similar um, protection, um, coastal navigation, uh, rivers. Uh, I mean, there's apparently major projects or major problems, um, for example, in Oban Harbour at the moment, affecting yachtsmen. These are all things which seriously damage uh, tourism. Um, lots and lots of people who are using towpaths, for example, uh, we encourage that because of great health um, benefits, uh, etc. They are rapidly dropping off because nobody wants to walk along a stinking, smelly ditch, which is what is happening rapidly. Um, with a lot of regeneration, we're getting complaints coming in all the time from businesses. You know, what happened to the boats that we were promised? The, the floating wallpaper no longer exists. Um, so that's really our, our, our situation. Massive amounts of problems which we can't get uh, resolved. Um, so our, really, uh, this is the main reason behind this application. Thank you very much for that. Um, if we can move to questions, I suppose you've really answered the question about um, you want a, a, an equivalent of England Wales Waterways Ombudsman because that would afford an independent um, somebody independent to look at your complaints. But I wonder what uh, discussions you've had with Scottish Government because some of this must be really about about policy. You know the, the, the fact that Scottish Canals is operating in a way that you think in policy terms is bad. It's damaging the canals network. It's focusing on other than their core business. Have you had discussions with the Scottish Government? Fairly, fairly briefly with the Scottish Government. Uh, I should really say that, um, I, I mean, I was in, involved with canals, uh, and especially the, the, the tourist um, uh, area of the canals since 1971. And the relationship with Scottish Canals and their stakeholders and, and businesses w w was excellent right up to about um, 2012 when it was taken over by uh, and became Scottish Canals. Uh, since then, th there has been a total lack of communication, um, you know, from them. And be because of that, we had to start um, Keep Canals, Canals Alive campaign, which has been really, really su successful. And at long last, they've been starting to, to listen to us. Um, Scottish Government have come along to our, our meetings and fully understand uh, the, the problem we, we've, been, we've been having. Um, I must admit, though, that uh, recently um, the Scottish Government appointed a, a new CEO, um, an interim CEO, to look after Scottish Canal since the last CEO left. And things have improved quite a bit, actually. Her attitude has been excellent. And she was appointed last Friday as the permanent CEO for, for the future. So we, we, hopefully we'll be able to give her a wee chance and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the, the problem that Scottish canals have, to be fair, is they don't have enough money from Scottish government to do the job properly. Uh, that's one reason. The other reason that we've been really concerned with is the fact that they've spent so much money 
on um, regenerating businesses, commercial operations, and all these things. And it's, it's been very obvious that they haven't been maintaining their statutory duty of looking after the canals. And that's why we're having so many things fall down. Um, there's major problems up in um, uh, on the Caledonian Canal with lag and locks, uh, these things. And, you know, it's going to become, if it, if it doesn't, if it's not addressed, it's going to become serious. You know, if you've got a, um, a big embankment uh, burst in Lillithgow, you've got the town of Lillithgow flooded. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's a wee bit extreme, but it, um, it gives you an example of what could happen if they don't look after them properly. Okay, so, so to me, it feels if there are two separate things here. There's the role of the government, since they've decided not to go the way that they've gone elsewhere in the United Kingdom, role of government in determining policy and the resources to support that policy, but separately your, your request for a, an independent ombudsman is like a backstop for that where policy is not being pursued. Would that be right? Yeah, I, uh, that's pretty close to the mark, I think. Um, one of the, the major problems, as, as Ronnie's just referred to, is we know that there isn't all that much money available. The main problem is, is it being spent in the right way? Mm -hmm. And it's clearly not being spent as it should be to maintain the, the waterways. They, they are a major tourist attraction. Um, they are a major benefit to the communities health-wise. Um, I mean, I got off the plane uh, early Monday morning, and my taxi driver on the way home was telling me that, you know, he's a classic case of what happened. Massively overweight, virtually on the edge of uh, diabetes and everything else, managed eventually to find the canal, get himself a bike, and from being able to cycle maybe 100 yards, he can now cycle 30 miles. He's lost a massive amount of weight, over five stone, and he's no longer in danger of developing diabetes. That's one out of thousands of cases. But again, you know, that's not going to continue unless the canal environment is, is properly maintained. Um, you know, we're losing boats and boat owners on, a, on virtually a weekly basis. Uh, at the moment, nobody can navigate the full length of the Fourth Clyde Canal. Um, we have another instance here of the new canal built and opened by Her Majesty last year, the Queen Elizabeth II Canal. Um, again, that was the design specification was that that should cater for yachts with a draft of six feet. So what do they do? They build it to six foot depth. Now, okay. no vessel with a draft of six foot is going to be able to move in six foot of water. Okay. So, you know, again, millions of pounds of public money possibly wasted mm -hmm. because even if it was operational, nobody can go anywhere. And we're losing massive amounts of tourism uh, tourist business from Northern Europe, Scandinavia, uh, where yachts regularly came across and used the transit to get to the west coast of Scotland, which is reckoned to be one of the best sailing areas in the world. Okay. We're going to come back to the question of finance from Rachel later, but I'll maybe ask Angus just now. Okay, um, thanks, convener, and good morning to, to the panel. I, I should declare uh, at the outset that I'm a member of the, the Cross Party Group on, on Recreational Boating and uh, Marine Tourism. Uh, and I've also got small sections of the, the Union Canal and the Forth and Clyde Canal uh, in my constituency. And I'm, I'm, I'm uh, acutely aware of the challenges that have been experienced by boaters and other stakeholders uh, regarding uh, their dealings with the uh, Scottish canals. And I, I recognise many of the examples raised by by Graham Harvey and uh, Ronald Russick, in, uh, including, in particular, the, the frustration regarding the lack of dredging. Um, I, I may come back on these, these points uh, uh, later on, but um, uh, your, your petition refers 
uh, to the monopoly position that Scottish Canals has and that it's operating unfairly in relation to, for example, access to the waiting lists for, for moorings and uh, the setting of fees. Uh, can you maybe give us a bit more detail uh, about your experience in relation to, to these issues? Yes. Um, around about, well, when the change happened in 2012, one of the schemes that they introduced was their living on water scheme, where they were trying to encourage people to bring boats onto the canal and live on those boats. To establish the market rate, um, in their words, they put 10 moorings throughout Scotland up for auction on eBay. In two cases, um, there were one family applying for each of the of two particular moorings. One was in Edinburgh, one was in Inverness. The mooring suggested fee was 3,500. Every time these people put a bid in, they were outbid. And in the case of the people in Edinburgh, when it reached £4,300, they said, no, enough is enough. Can't afford any more. Within two weeks, they received communication from Scottish Canals saying that the person that had outbid them had disappeared. So they could have the mooring at 4,300. Now that's in total con contravention of all auction rules. Had, in the case of two bidders, if one drops out, they either rerun the auction or the remaining bidder gets the product or service at their original bid. Um, one was bad enough, but we found out that two, uh, it happened to two people. Um, I was waiting for the third because, as an ex-police officer, I was looking at um, potential criminal action under the Moorov Doctrine. Um, <clears throat> those were subsequently withdrawn um, and the auctions on eBay were cancelled. They then went to uh, looking at a complete price review uh, across the whole uh, length of all the canals. Um, originally, they tried to base it on a consultancy report which was submitted by one of the directors and his company. Uh, that eventually got blown out of the water, if you'll pardon the expression, and they brought in a so-called independent team of uh, consultants uh, called Gerald Eve Stroke GVA. Uh, we questioned the independence because they're a subsidiary group of one of the major funders of the Kelpies project. Uh, Gerald Eve have also been used by Her Majesty's Treasury um, to do various things on business rates and all the rest of it. So their in independence could be called into question. They used a variety of um, standards to ensure um, they were coming up with uh, proper costings. Most of those were seriously questioned. They were using comparisons with house rents for local authorities um, throughout the country, looking at costings from marinas, but all the marinas that they were looking at were in England and Wales, because we don't have equivalent marina facilities in Scotland. Um, on a number of occasions, they came up with costings which were 100% higher than what boaters were originally, or at that time, paying. Falkirk is a good example, where uh, they decided that the annual fee per metre would be £106.70, or £106.80, which was 20 pence short of what Scottish Canals told them they were intending to charge, or that was being charged, when in fact the boaters were only paying around £53, £54 a metre at that time. 
Now, with those price increases, most of us who were boaters at the time had increases in excess of 100%. So in their kindness, they decided that they would introduce the increases by £100 per annum until such time as people reached the maximum amount. And in some cases, that was going to take about 20 years. They also added in that they were going to review the situation again in five years' time. So we're having all these uh, dramatic increases forced upon us. And the other problem with that is people living on water in their boats have no security of tenure. So many of them are frightened to complain in case they get forced off the water by Scottish canals, which has been threatened on numerous occasions. Uh, and their latest missive sent out recently to all boaters, reminding boaters that they had to keep their craft in a clean and tidy condition along with the, the environment. And they had to display their licenses prominently on their craft, which would be fine if they'd actually sent out the new licenses to people because, you know, people were repaying, submitting their payment for their licenses and waiting well over two months for them to be sent out from Scottish canals. And yet, you know, on the one hand, they're claiming, if you don't show your licence, we're going to put you off the water, but they haven't sent the licences out. This is the sort of issues that we're continually facing, uh, and our members are continually facing. Can I just add that when we were unhappy about the price increases, I'd written to the Minister of Transport to ask what was the legislation covering this. And I was told that Scottish Canals brought over the legislation from England and the main remit was to set prices. There was no amount of constraints on it or how much they could charge or how little they could charge. So they just charge what they like. And this causes a great deal of hardship to people who are living on, in the, on the canals. Thanks. And people have actually had to sell their boats because they can't afford to live in the canals. Could I just want to add one additional thing there? Um, in the PIDA report, which was used uh, leading up to as part of the evidence f for the Millennium Link funding, one of the things that was stated clearly in the PIDA report was that while income from boaters was interesting, it was irrelevant. Now, boaters on the canal network throughout Scotland are the only ones that are paying for the use of the canal. Um, when we've questioned this in various uh, formats, uh, the response from Scottish Canals has always been, well, 99% of our customers are quite happy. 90% of those 99% customers do not have any financial connection with Scottish Canals. So cannot really be considered as customers. You know, they're, they're able, like everybody else, to use the facilities, but they're certainly not paying for them. The only people that are paying for the facilities are the boaters. Okay, um, that's all very helpful. Presumably your concerns regarding the uh, Scottish Canals pricing policy were fed back to to the management uh, at the time, but I'm, I'm just wondering if you'd raised... Sent back and they also sent to the Ombudsman, and the Ombudsman came back and said he had no remit to deal with the finances because Scottish Canals have been given the the price setting, but there's no constraints on how much price they set. Mm -hmm. Did you raise the concerns with the Chair, not the CEO, but the Chair of Scottish Canals at any point? Yes, yes we raised it with everybody. Yes, we were, we were told in no uncertain terms, suck it up, sunshine. Take it or leave it. And we um, raised it with the Ombudsman, which is why we felt we had to come today to ask about a water Ombudsman who will only deal with issues to do with waters, whether it's river or canal. But our specific interest is the canal, because canals are dying just now. They're closed for a year. In that year, people will stop using the canals. And we're going to lose a very valuable facet. Okay. Yeah. Brian? Um, thank you, Good morning to the panel. 
you've answered quite a lot of what I was going to ask, uh, um, but I, I just wanted to, to, to reiterate here, you, you state you've, you actually have tried to resolve your issues with uh, with Scottish Water, um, and, and you've, you've talked about the, the, some of the responses that you've you've had uh, from Scottish Canals, I wonder if you, could, you want to expand on that, but also, I think the new CEO is in place, um, and, and, and you, you feel there might be a little bit of, of movement in there? Is, Hopefully, um, several of us have already met the new CEO and, uh, as Ronnie mentioned earlier on, uh, she seems to be extremely switched on and capable. Our main concern is that um, she might be hamstrung by the current chairman um, who, to be honest, has clearly um, stated on several occasions uh, he is totally against powered craft on waterways. Doesn't understand that powered craft are needed to help keep the weed down. Thinks that uh, the waterways should be left for canoeists. Um, he has made a variety of threats uh, over the last two or three years. Uh, which have been extremely unhelpful. The chair's not able to defend himself. No, here, yes, but I'm, I apologise. I mean, I think you've highlighted your concern. It's certainly something we'll pursue as a, a, yeah. a committee in terms of whether we believe people are yeah. conducting the role properly. In general terms, one of the major issues has been a total lack of consultation with stakeholders and others who may be involved. Um, the, the price increase... There was no consultation on that until uh, the decisions on the costings were made. And when we complained to the Scottish Government, um, the response that we got back was a, a letter written by Scottish Canal saying, we are consulting with people. Yeah, the con consultation basically was, this is what's happening, take it or leave it. Okay. Uh -huh. I think from a, it's just from a purely practical uh, uh, perspective here. I, mean, I know you're looking for a, a, an independent ombudsman, um, which you, they have in England, in, the, in England and Wales. I'm just wondering whether Scotland has enough inland waterways to, to, to justify this. And also, you've kind of alluded to this, but who who ultimately is responsible here? You know, there, there has to ulti somebody has to ultimately have the decision-making powers to be able to uh, on, on these matters. Um, well, basically the ultimate responsibility is with uh, the Transport Minister or in the Scottish Government. They're the ones that signed the agreements uh, for the Millennium Funding and, uh, you know, the requirements for ongoing maintenance. Sorry. It's just that the, the, the ask here is to have an independent ombudsman mm. and... Uh, if, if, that, if that's your ask, and that falls, uh, you know, and, and through, the, through this process, it doesn't leave you anywhere. Um, and which is what, why I'm asking where the, where, the, where the responsibility lies here. Yeah. Um. I think we have gone through the ombudsman and gone through those channels. We've gone through the Minister of Transport, and we've basically been left with no other option but to look at maybe somebody who would just specifically deal with water board issues, canal issues, water issues, in terms of the monopoly that Scottish canals have and the attitude that they have towards their customers. So we feel somebody needs to listen to us. Okay. We're not being listened to by Scottish canals. They have the power. They are a monopoly. They can decide what's happening. They can say what they like, and they do. And we feel there needs to be some check and balance. And an ombudsman, we've been to the ombudsman, we've had no satisfaction there, so we're asking for a water ombudsman. Or somebody who will specifically deal with these issues to do with the canals. There are uh, two other options available to us. Under the Transport Act, uh, we can request a judicial review um, or we can uh, request um, a formal public inquiry. Now, the public inquiry can be organised independently 
by ourselves without government involvement. But uh, the judicial review um, could be seriously embarrassing for so many and uh, we're not particularly keen to go down that route. Uh, it would be expensive, but raising the funds wouldn't be a major problem. Um, so that, that really is, is the situation we're in. You know, if we have an independent waterways ombudsman that can then uh, follow up most of our issues uh, once they've been investigated, fine. But, you know, it still remains for us uh, to make a decision on whether we go with a judicial review or a public inquiry. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. In your submission, you say the Scottish Canal has what it refers to as a strong network of advisory groups to assist it in carrying out its regulatory duties. Can you expand on who a strong network of groups is? Yeah, we've. there are a number of um, canal societies right across all the canals, uh, including the Caledonian Canal. Um, as, as I said in our introduction, between Ronnie and I, we've got over 80 years experience. We have a hell of a lot of members in these organizations that have vast amounts of experience in engineering, boat building, a whole range of areas. Uh, one of our members on uh, the Lowland Canal Volunteers Group is actually uh, the retired senior British Waterways engineer. Um, we have uh, access to uh, information assistance through the Inland Waterways Association um, and various other organisations who also have their expertise. Um, we have put forward on numerous occasions solutions for issues, um, in particular uh, things like um, landing stages or whatever for canal side businesses. Uh, you know, they insist on providing floating pontoons, which are not necessary uh, because there's no tidal movement on uh, these canals. Um, 40,000 pounds was quoted for uh, a landing stage at the Bridge 49 Bistro on the Union Canal, for example. Now, putting in a basic landing stage would cost a tenth of that maximum but they're not prepared to look at these alternatives. Uh, I mean, I appreciate that in a number of occasions, in, including Bridge 49, there have been issues with Historic Scotland in the past, um, saying, oh, well, you can't put anything new. But in that case, we're not putting anything new. We're replacing something that existed right back in 1824 when the canal was opened. <coughs> and, and the remains of the original landing stage are still there. Now, that sort of situation pertains. Uh, we, we do have the skills, the expertise, uh, the marketing skills, all the rest of it. We have offered them on numerous occasions. And the response was, oh, great, yes, oh, we'll get in touch. Our overall ob objective actually is to work along with Scottish Canals, as we had done for many, 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 many years. Uh, and that's where we want to end up. And I, I think the new CEO fully understands that. We don't, have, we don't want to be in a conflict um, position with them. That, that, that doesn't get us anywhere at all. But at the moment, we're just not being listened to. Yep. Um, you also say some of these advisory groups might be working to their own agendas. Can you tell the committee what these agendas are? Sorry, could you say that? You also say in your submission that some of the advisory groups might have their own agendas and are working to them. Um, can you tell the committee what these own agendas are from the advisory groups? Um, I think the the uh, the agendas from all the advisory groups is to get the canals back to where they should be and stop this uh, degeneration that is going on at the moment. Um, as I say, you know, most of us spent years and years and years trying to get canals improved, get them open, um, whatever. The um, agendas 
I would suggest, are more on the side of uh, Scottish canals rather than the volunteer groups. Um, as far as all the volunteer groups are concerned, including all the constituent members of Keep Canals Alive, and you know, as I said before, these involve people like RYA Scotland, um, various different yachting groups like the, the Fourth Yachts Association, as well as canals or canal organisations, river organisations, other users, you know, like fishermen, um, canoeists, uh, rowers, a whole range of people are being affected or potentially affected. Our objective is to keep the canals alive, basically. Um, the other agendas, uh, clearly, um, as, as from our point of view, are on the side of Scottish canals. I mean, setting up um, regeneration companies, um, you know, owned by Scottish canals, a, you know, and then getting involved in million pound projects all over the place. Um, not really, as far as we can see, covered by the legislation or even Scottish Government's requirements about encouraging regeneration. Nowhere does it say that Scottish canals should abdicate their responsibility for the maintenance, you know, by going down different routes. And in fact, last year, Scottish Government had a consultation uh, document out about the future of planning um, in Scotland. Scottish Canals responded to that and one of their answers was Scottish Canals are moving away from being a canal company to a more leisure orientated organisation and we have had considerable problems with various different local authorities in their planning procedures. Now, you know, they have clearly stated in writing, in a government document, they are moving away from being a canal company. Thank you. Um, our last question, Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, and uh, welcome to the panel. Um, I just wanted to ask, what does the independent waterways ombudsman in England and Wales provide that is not being delivered in Scotland? Um, the word is independent. Okay. So the issues that we've raised with the ombudsman have not been dealt with. So therefore, the issues that we are raising in Scotland are the same as the ones that are raised in England. But we have nobody in Scotland that will listen and deal with the issues, whether it's to do with monopoly or about residential voters' rights, because there's no rights apart from the right to be evicted and be taken to court. That's the only right you've got as a residential voter. So several issues have come up over the pricing, over the independence, over community moorings. There's a lot of separate issues that have come up that have predominantly to do with water issues and canals. And we feel an independent body would deal with that, or an independent person. That's not being dealt with here, because we've gone through the channels of going through the Ombudsman, going through the Minister of Transport, and we've re received no satisfaction and Scottish Canals. So although we've got a new director, we still need to feel that there's not just one issue, there's several issues that have to be dealt with. Um, to do with security of tenure for people on the boats, to deal with pricing, which is a continual going, comparing count, living on a boat to living in a house. The two are separate. There's been lots of issues came up about that, about the monopoly, the fact that you can't discuss things with Scottish canals because they have the monopoly position of saying, we can set prices, there's no constraints, there's nothing to stop them doing what they want. And I think that's why we need an independent water board. Okay. So, in... Wales and England, are the canals maintained? Um, <clears throat> they have many of the same issues that we have up here. Um, funding is always a problem, but um, over the years there have been several organisations that have um, appeared. Um, there's an organisation called the Waterways Recovery Group, which is all volunteers, uh, and they have regular camps where people turn up for a fortnight working on 
sections of the canals and all the rest of it. They have actually been in Scotland um, before, many, many years ago, helping uh, some of the volunteer groups out. Funding is always an issue. Um, nowhere is perfect. In the situation in England and Wales is not perfect, but uh, they seem to be far more innovative uh, in many areas down there than what is happening in Scotland. I mean, for example, uh, on the Mon and Breck Canal in South Wales, which is gradually being reopened all the way down into Newport uh, to the uh, River and Sea connection. Uh, one of their members is an engineer and he's designed and built new lock gates out of steel. Their in sections can be easily installed, don't need massive crane work or anything else, and they will last up to 100 years. Whereas current timber locks are accepted will last about 25 years. Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to establish is whether an independent ombudsman, as they have in England Wales, would actually then unlock the funding that you need for the maintenance and the assage management, because you're currently in a position where the revenue is not going to meet that need for the asset assets to be maintained. I wanted to ask you specifically, you say that the regeneration company has a statutory obligation to maintain the canal. Why is that not being fulfilled? <laughs> you, you, you ask the government. <laughs> so if you had an independent ombudsman would that, because ombudsman is all about process, would that then ensure that they maintained the canal? I think an independent ombudsman dealing with water issues would be able to bring the issues to government, would be able to look at not just that, but other issues as well. I mean, the Lowland Canal, three quarters of it's closed for almost a year now. People can't use it. In England, I don't know of any canals that have been closed. I know there's problems with fixing things, but they seem to get it done a lot quicker. It's not just the issues of maintaining the canals, it's issues to do with the pricing, the fact that there's no constraints in Scottish canals. It's issues in relation to re residential boaters having no rights. I mean, most people have, if you have a house, you have rights. So residential boaters don't have any rights. On the licence fee, um, is any of that hypothecated to the maintenance spend? The, um, the last figures that I saw... Um, the licence fees um, and mooring fees, the income from boaters amounts to roughly 5% of their income. Now, we, you know, they get a grant every year and the grant has been increased um, over, the, over the years uh, in comparison to what other organisations have received. Our main issue is, yeah, we need money. Yeah, there's £70 million pound backlog uh, of repairs and maintenance required. Government give a grant. What is happening to the equivalent amount that they are raising through their own revenue sources? That is not being ploughed back into the maintenance and ongoing upkeep because of being put into various regeneration company projects. Okay, on that point, have you asked Michael Matheson for a ju judicial review? Not yet. He's, he's so new into the um, being transport minister, we haven't really got in, in contact with him yet. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, the but all these issues have been brought to the Minister of Transport over the last year. There have been several letters with each issue being sent to him. So it has been raised. The issue has been raised in Parliament. Thank you very much. I think we've spent a lot longer on this perhaps than I had um, anticipated in terms of management, but I think it's because you've been raising really um, interesting issues. And I'm sure the committee agrees with that. I mean, I've got a particular fondness for the Crinan Canal in terms of my own um, experience of the canal. So I think there's a lot of... Um, goodwill towards the canal system in, in Scotland and what you see I think is very interesting. I suppose what the committee has to decide and, and we will want to make a judgment on is we agree there's a problem, we seem to agree there's a problem 
around maintenance, whether your solution is the one that's going to address that problem or gives you a backstop is something I think I certainly would want to explore, but I wonder if members have suggestions about how we take this forward. Brian? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking, I'm looking at what the petition is actually asking for. I think what I was trying to get to in my questioning was that is that going to be the best solution? Because if it falls, if, you know, if, if on a practical level, uh, in terms of, of creating an, uh, an independent ombudsman specifically to look at this, uh, you know, and, and if, if that if that's not practical, where does that leave us? And I just wonder whether do we have the you know, because because that's what what the ask is of the, uh, the the petition. Do we have the latitude to to sort of explore a little bit further? I, I mean, I'm specifically looking. I'm, uh, for me, it's you know, it's the question of are, are Scottish canals actually exercising the statutory duties as per you know as per policy remit, and and, and who are they responsible to? And, and you know, I think, it, yeah, I think that's what we need to explore is the policy failure that's driven people to the point where they think the only solution is to have an independent ombudsman that's going to uphold your rights and listen to your concerns. And it may be that, so if that's why we're asking for that, I think we have to identify why the other thing's not being done. Why is there not constraint and charging? Why is there not a focus on maintenance? Why are they able to diversify their business and not do their core business, which is what feels to me to be the suggestion? Um, I mean, why would you call yourself Scottish Canals and then not allow the, the canals to be open for the year? But, you know, these are things I think in terms of the spirit of the petition, which is identify, you've identified a problem, you think the ombudsman, an independent ombudsman, might be the solution to that, I think that's what we're going to explore. Um, can I suggest that certainly we'd want to write to Scottish Government, specifically to the Minister for Transport, to if he recognises these problems and what he's going to do about it, and his view on, on the, um, whether there, there is necessity for an ombudsman. Is there anybody else? David? Uh -huh. Convener, um, as a publicly funded body, would Audit Scotland not have a role to play to see if they've deviated from a remit in their, uh, states, their statutory duties? Mm -hmm. Okay. Rachel? I would um, be keen to write to Scottish ca Canals um, to establish their position on, on, on their um, statutory obligation for investment to maintain the canals because this is um, seriously going to have an effect on tourism. Tourism is a really important aspect of the economy in Scotland um, and, and from what we've heard today um, there, there is a category of failures. Okay. Angus? Yeah, I think we also need to hear from um, other stakeholders such as the, the Scottish Waterways Trust the RYA, which has been mentioned uh, this morning in evidence, and the Canal and River Trust, and also the Inland Waterways Association. Okay, so it's a range of organisations. Brian? Yeah, I, I would actually be quite interested to, to, to see here the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman to see why they have they, they don't feel it's within their remit to, to, to comment or do mm -hmm. something like this. Yeah, I mean, I suppose my experience of the Ombudsman is it tends to be pretty limited what they can do. They can only identify whether the process has been followed. If the process is flawed, I don't know where that leaves you. So I think there are, there are two... We're coming at this from two angles. I think we're speaking for the Committee and saying we recognise the problem and the way you've identified them. We then need to look at, is there an option of an Ombudsman which exists elsewhere in the United Kingdom? Why is it, the Scottish Government has actively chosen to maintain Scotch canals separately from a charity, they therefore have an obligation to do the maintenance and the and kind of a, the responsibility to make sure the thing is maintained and we want to ask them about that. Rachel? Would it be worth um, ask also asking the Canal and River Trust um, in England and Wales their comments on this particular petition? We could do. We could ask them you know, what what is what's their view of their role in terms of protecting the, the maintenance of their of their waterways. I think the other thing to, um, to do as well is to look at where they've been investing their money and what return they're getting for that money. When, when they, they broke up between British Waterways and became Scottish Canals, they received over 100 million in, um, as a dowry, if you like to call it. We've no idea. I've been asking since February, the chairman, um, for a set of a specific accounts on that because it's, it's these investments that have got to be ploughed back into the canal to actually mm -hmm. uh, maintain it and keep it running. This feels like something, maybe an opportunity at some point to bring Scotch canals before the committee, but we can see what, you know, 
sometimes it's easier by direct questioning rather than by correspondence. But I think we'll start with correspondence then when these issues perhaps your point is, is raised through David's suggestion that we, we highlight these questions to Audit Scotland. Um, I think with that, I can just say thank you very much for your attendance. I think it's been really interesting and, and quite thought-provoking because it may be the, the solution you've identified not be, be the one that eventually emerged from this, but I certainly think we would want with yourself to shed some light on why um, our, our waterways don't appear to be maintained the way that we would hope. And I think you've given us a lot of... Um, things to think about and I think we're going to pursue these with all the bodies that we've identified. So can I thank you very much for your attendance and I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table. meeting back to order um, and the next petition of consideration is petition 1701 on change the law to allow adoption for people over the age of 18 by Nathan Sparling. Members will be aware that, that SPICE published a blog this week providing impartial information and analysis on the issues raised in the petition. We will take evidence today from the petitioner Nathan Sparling who is joined by Caroline Dempster who also has a personal interest in this petition. Can I welcome you both and perhaps apologise for slightly later a starting point for your petition than we might otherwise have expected. You have up to five minutes to make an opening statement, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Thank you very much, convener, and to the rest of the committee for inviting Caroline and I here today to give evidence on this petition as part of the campaign to change the law to allow people over the age of 18 to be adopted. Um, my dad came into my life when I was 12. I've never known my biological father. In fact, my birth certificate reflects this as it's blank where most people would have a father's name. I've never wanted to know who he was. My dad, Brian, shaped me as a person. He continues to provide love and support to me. And I was very a very delighted big brother to just five years ago when we welcomed Thomas and William into our family. It wasn't until the age of 18, however, that I considered how I could repay that love and support. For men, many families in the US, Canada, Germany and Spain, stepchildren over the age of 18 could approach their step-parents with adoption papers for a very emotional birthday or Christmas present. 
finding out that I was not able to be adopted because I'd reached an arbitrary age set by the state left me feeling though my special moment of asking my father to adopt me was stolen from me. I remember as if it was yesterday walking my mum down the aisle at their wedding allowing them to make their commitment of love in the law yet rather than being too young to make such a milestone decision to show our commitment as father and son before the law I found myself too old. I launched the campaign in March this year because I believe the right to a family life to the important feeling of belonging to a family that adoption can bring should not be restricted to those under the age of 18 that every family deserves the ability to formalise their relationships in the eyes of the law, and that we should not force people to make such a big decision as adoption before they turn 18. The 2011 census showed that over 50,000 families had a step-parent in the household. Now, whilst not everyone will want to be adopted by their step-parent, what became apparent after I launched the campaign was that many people found themselves in a similar position as I did. Shockingly, many contacted me to say they didn't even know this was the law. Just last week, I was contacted by a young woman who said that she'd turned 18 in April, and thanks to the spotlight being shown on this issue in March, she and her stepfather were able to rush to get the papers in before she turned 18. Interestingly, her adoption was granted after she turned 18. I'm sure Caroline will be able to tell her own story, but Adoption UK told a meeting in this parliament that they regularly deal with calls on their helpline from families who want to adopt stepchildren or foster children who have passed the age of 18. Now, I've argued that the law needs to change in order to comply with the Human Rights Act. Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights provides that everyone has the right to respect for their private and family life and that there shall be no interference by a public authority with the exercise of this right except in such accordance with the law and as is necessary in a democratic society for the protection of health or morals. In making this argument based on a confliction with human rights, we have to consider if the law as it currently stands interferes with my right to respect for family life. I would argue that the mutual enjoyment by parent and child of each other's company, which includes a sense of belonging to one another, constitutes a fundamental element of family life and that the law as it currently stands interferes inappropriately and may hinder this enjoyment, lacking the sense of belonging to a family member. There are also three other arguments to consider. Is this interference on human rights in accordance with the law? When it comes to people over the age of 18 who want to be adopted, I believe the current legislation held in the Children and Adoption Act is simply arbitrary and prejudicial, therefore cannot be in accordance with the law. Secondly, does the interference pursue a legitimate aim? What I believe lawmakers have to consider is what is the purpose of blocking people over the age of 18 from being adopted? I would argue that in an ever-changing world, growing and blended families, that there's no legitimate aim for this restriction. And lastly, were the measures taken necessary in a democratic society? Simply put, I don't believe restricting adoption rights in this way is necessary, and therefore there's a need for legislative amendments. In looking at these areas, it can simply be said that for people over the age age of 18, whether they be a stepchild in a blended family or a care experienced young person who wants to be adopted by a foster family, the law as it currently stands is not human rights compliant. There are a number of challenges that in the interest of time perhaps we can discuss during the questioning, but I'd just add that I believe there's definitely an opportunity afforded in Parliament through the Family Law Bill, which would allow adult adoption to be considered in government time, and I'm very grateful for the committee's time today. Okay, thank you very much for that. Perhaps I can... Uh, open up the questions. That, um, in your petition, you refer to the Scottish Government's response to the parliamentary question asked by Kezia Dugdale, and the full text of that is included in our meeting papers. But can I ask you for your thoughts on the Scottish Government's response? Yeah, I was um, very surprised at this quick change of tone from the Government. Initially, when the, um, this campaign was um, in the media, the Government said that they would look very closely at this issue. Um, then, for a parliamentary question to be submitted and say that they had no, um, no plans to look at it. I've since um, engaged with the Government on a number of occasions um, and at a meeting in Parliament that was chaired by Kezia Dugdale MSP um, just a few months ago before recess. Um, a couple of Government officials in, in this area attended, and I know that they've briefed the Minister um, on, on their thoughts on this. What's your sense of the key motivation in saying there won't be change? So I think it's quite um, 
it's quite difficult when you have um, the responsibility for adult adoption landing with the Minister for Children. Um, so th I guess there's a difficulty there where they, not only the Minister but the officials are looking at adoption from very much a child-focused and a um, child protection issue. And um, what this petition and the campaign obviously tr is trying to do is broaden that out and say that the right to family life and, and uh, child, um, protection and support of a loving family doesn't just end at 18. Um, so I think that's probably where there's a challenge at, but that's what the, the hope is to move that debate on. So it may be to redirect the questions to the Justice Minister then? Potentially. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Yeah, uh, good morning. Um, the committee understands that there are uh, other legal steps that could be taken to achieve uh, similar ends to adult adoption, such as a uh, step parent, including the stepchild in the will or formalising a change of surname to match the step parents. I, I think it, it would be fair to say that, this, uh, that you don't think these steps uh, go far enough, and, and if not, could you maybe tell us why not? Um, I, I don't think they go far enough. It's already steps that I've, I've taken in, in my life. In fact, I'd changed my name before I was 18, but never considered adoption before I was 18. Um, and I think that one, one of the main important issues is Forcing a young person to decide between adoption before the age of 18 is quite a milestone step. Um, what the the current legal aspects, whereas changing your name and including in a will, um, are, are important steps. I think that actually for, for me, having my father's name on my birth certificate is more important than knowing whether or not I would inherit from, from him because that simply isn't a motivation in this, this area. But being able to, to feel that sense of belonging and um, family life like that important step of having his name on, on my birth certificate is more than changing my name could ever do. And I know, I think Caroline... Yeah. Uh, I, I think it, it is different from that. I have made a will in favour of my daughter. We have mutual power of attorney. But it, it, is, it is different from child adoption where child protection is, is a vital thing. This is two consenting adults wanting to make a public and legal commitment to their relationship as a parent and child. It, it is not just for inheritance purposes. And my daughter's now married, so she's got another name anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, think, I think you'll know that, that uh, the changing of any law is a, is a very significant step. And if that, uh, that, that is enacted in law and, and we go through the adoption process, I suppose, you know, uh, what would happen you know, once, you know, if, we, if I'm playing devil's advocate here, what would happen once adoption has taken place and then one of the parties changed their mind? What, what, would, what would happen in, in, in those circumstances? I can't say I have foresaw such an um, issue, certainly from everyone that we've spoken to. It's been such a long period of time that they've wanted to be adopted. Um, I, I guess the, the policy of, of how an adoption order could be rescinded is... Is, uh, is way beyond um, my, my knowledge, but um, I could certainly put the committee in touch with a couple of family lawyers who have been in touch with me that sort of have looked at these issues. If I could just mm. say, I mean, I, my daughter was not, I didn't meet her until she was 21 when I met her father and married him later. Um, I looked into adopting her like a lot of young people, she'd been emotionally affected by her parents' divorce and her father had brought her up since she was about nine. Um, I asked her in her early 20s if she, she, it was she who wanted me to call myself mum rather than anything else and I asked her if she'd like me to adopt her and she said yes she would and I went and found that I couldn't which was disappointing for us and we weren't quite as tenacious as Nathan I'm afraid. Um, she's now 35, married, in a much more stable position but she would still like me to be able to adopt her. And it's, it, it isn't just a legal thing, it, it is a public commitment and, I don't know, some kind of security. Mm -hmm. But then what would happen if you fell out with an ordinary child? <laughs> she can't unparent somebody very easily. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, Nathan's already covered uh, partly um, s some of... Uh, what I'm about to ask. However, um, the, the committee and our briefing papers include a, a section on pol policy issues associated with adult adoptions. 
Um, so I was wondering if you could expand a, a bit further on your views uh, on the Scottish Government's position that the current adoption system is focused on safeguarding the welfare of a child, and it, it would also be helpful um, to get your views on the, the view that there's a dwindling welfare need once a young person reaches adulthood. So I have no objection to the current adoption system being focused on safeguarding children. Um, essentially, what this proposal would do is to add another layer of the, an adoption process. One of the challenges that um, has been raised by um, legal professionals is the transfer, what and the current adoption order um, creates is the transfer of parental rights and responsibilities. Once you reach 18, those parental rights and responsibilities are dissolved. As is the case that I mentioned in my opening remarks, the Scottish courts do grant adoption orders to people over the age of 18 at the moment, provided their papers have been submitted before they reached 18. So there is clearly legal will to be able to grant such an adoption order when the transfer of parental rights and responsibilities is not required. Um, I think um, in the dwindling welfare rights, I think obviously young people over the age of 18 um, can m move out of their house, do work and don't have the need for pr those kinds of parental rights and responsibilities that safeguard children. But um, even in the care experience system, we've seen that with the, the government have changed their policy to allow people to return to care up until the age of 21. Um, we've, we know that the, the, the family life that's created by um, step parents and parents and love and support um, can be protected and has multiple benefits um, for young people, no matter what age they are, even up to the age of 35, as with Caroline's daughter. Um, it's, I think, too simple an issue to say that it's you don't have any welfare rights because the love and support that my father has given me up till the age that I am now, um, I could, it, it's it's priceless, and um, that's I think the important thing to recognise is that family life does reach beyond 18, and it's very important. Okay, thank you. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. Um, good morning to both of you. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, how you actually felt uh, when you became adopted and what it really means to you. So not been adopted. Oh, I'm sorry. So can you explain what happened then for when you were 18? So when I discovered that I couldn't be adopted, um, yeah. I, Sorry, I didn't mean that. I, Yes, so um, what would it mean to you mm. if you were adopted? Yeah, so as, as I said in my opening remarks, one of the things that I wanted to do was give my father adoption papers to ask him to adopt me. That, that whole ceremony of, of such that is so evident if even if you google family adoption on you on, on youtube you can see very emotional videos of people presenting adoption papers to their step parents um, and asking that question it's a very loving bond um, that can be created and i do feel like the opportunity to have that moment has been taken away from me because uh, because the law states that it's only for people under 18 and simply yep. as a teenager I hadn't considered that that was what I wanted to do. I'm sure that and I have heard from many people um, since the, the launching this campaign that they've said they'd never considered um, something like adoption before they were 18 and it's only in adulthood that they really see the benefits that being ad adopted by their step parents can bring to the whole family and the wider family. As I say, um, I've got baby brothers that are, are five years old now um, and cementing that formal relationship with my, who, yes, I call my father, but if I was to get married, he would be in a marriage certificate as my stepfather. I don't have a name in my birth certificate. These are important aspects of, of life that, that I would feel very disappointed in the, a state interference that says he has to be put down as my stepfather in a marriage certificate. So um, adult ad adoption happens in other countries um, such as Japan and mm. um, parts of the States, Australia, and I wondered if you'd looked at examples of what has happened there, how mm. that has benefited people, and do you think it's unusual that this hasn't been explored before in Scotland? I think 
for for me, I, I did explore the different um, areas in where adult adoption is is legal. Uh, specifically, Canada is an area that probably has closer resemblance to Scotland. And I spoke to the Adoption Council of Canada. Um, what they see from adoption, adult adoption being possible, is a a lot of foster kids being adopted by their foster parents once they've reached the age of eighteen, because that's a formalised relationship that they want to make. Um, in saying that, there is also restrictions placed by the law in Canada that give the courts an ability to judge whether or not there was a family life um, in that relationship. That is a protection that would protect the system from abuse, and I completely support that. Um, can you repeat the second part of your question? So it was, why do you think that um, Scotland hasn't explored mm. this before? I, I don't know. I think that for most people, and like Caroline's already said, when you find out what the law is, you just go away. <laughs> hug your shoulders and go away. I had many conversations with people over the last year to 18 months of talking about the fact that I was disappointed of the, the law, and um, I was told to just get on and try and change it. And finally, how do you believe that you can change the mind of the Scottish Government? I think the Scottish Government's mind is open to being changed. Um, and... I think it is, on, on this issue, certainly from, from informal conversations I've had with the Minister, I'm aware that she's following this issue. Um, I think that it is about broadening the the church of adoption is about opening up um, the the right to family life beyond the age of 18. We've all, as I've said before, we've already done that for care experienced young people who want to return to care up to the age of 21. So there is already these kinds of acknowledgements um, and courts are already granting adoptions to people over the age of 18. So there's clearly um, a will in the system, but we just need to to have some legislative amendments either in the Children and Adoption Act or in the upcoming Family Law Bill in order to make that happen. Where was your friend that um, was adopted the process before she was 18 but then adopted after she was 18 through the court? So she was in Scotland. In Scotland. Yes. Um, so she, because of the campaign, um, didn't know that there was that restriction um, and then in the preceding month before her 18th birthday was able to s s get the paper submitted and it took about six months for the adoption order to be granted. Now, if there was really a legal problem with granting the transferal of parental rights and responsibilities after the age of 18 and those have dissolved, that simply wouldn't have happened. So I don't believe that there is such a problem. Thank you. Your emotions don't change when you suddenly hit 80. You know, it, what, what we're talking about is really a, make, the ability to make a public and legal commitment and an avowal of the relationship that has developed. And it's, it's hard to put your finger on if you haven't been there, I guess. But it's, it's important to us. I can sympathise because my children are, uh, my eldest children, 18 and uh, uh, 21, and they've become more needy now than they ever were. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder whether you know, you're saying that you, you feel that the, not to put words in your mouth, that perhaps the Scottish Government is at least looking at this and, and considering it further. Are there other organisations or groups who you think are resisting it? That you know, that's, that's, or it's just something that you're not aware of, you know, whether there are faith groups or family groups or whatever who. Has anybody expressed any concern about it? Not, not in insurmountable ways. Um, in the meeting that was held in Parliament, there was some concern over my initial thoughts and how this could be adopted was to remove the words under 18 from the Children and Adoption Act. That seems, from talking to lawyers, like it's too simplistic a, a, a fix for this, this issue and that actually, because Scots law is quite complicated in the the transfer of parental rights and responsibilities, some more simplified adoption order would need to be created for people over the age of 18. So that those views were, were talked about quite in detail at the, the meeting in Parliament, but I was surprised with the level of support from organisations like Adoption UK in Scotland who 
talked about the importance of the sense of belonging that adoption can bring um, and the number of calls that they get, but not all, only adoption organisations, but a lot of legal firms have been following this issue since the campaign started and have been talking about what, how to overcome those challenges because they also get contacted by people that want to be adopted. So is your sense that what people are looking for is something that's legally sustainable to yes. deliver what you want as opposed to there being philosophical or ideological opposition? Yes, exactly. And it, it is a different animal. It isn't a vulnerable child being placed with somebody. Mm -hmm. It is two consenting mm. adults wanting to celebrate the relationship that's developed to, to make that commitment publicly and legally. And it is a different animal. It has to be called something a little different. Well, they. <laughs> OK. I think, I think we've come to the end of our questions. I think people have found that very useful. I wonder if members have suggestions of how we might take this forward. Brian? I, 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 I think it's really interesting. I think um, my my initial response to this was I didn't know that <laughs> that, 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 that there was a, that, that, that there would be an issue with that. And I've, I've got personal interest in this. I actually coach a young lad who is a foster, uh, 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 foster parents who have, have come to me as he approaches the age of 18 to talk about the, the legal implications of, of, of that sort of arbitrary age. So I think, you know, I definitely think it's, 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 it's something we should have a look at. I'd be interested to, he's, you know, it's, it's given the evidence you said today, I'd be really interested to see what the Law Society mm -hmm. uh, would, uh, what, what they would say from a legal perspective. But I'm more about trying to work out what the objections would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because presumably the fear is there's a law of unintended consequence and yeah. that would be what you would be testing yeah. against. I think we want to speak to the Scottish Government, the Law Society, any others? earlier that um, perhaps mm. this doesn't fall under the remit of Marie Todd, so perhaps we should be um, looking to Humza Youssef to um, ask him the yeah. same question yeah. as whether this really is in the um, right person's um, hands. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, another suggestion, I think, is maybe to speak to the Qualities Minister, Christina McKelvey. If there's an issue around human rights, it might be something in that as well. Um, I think we want to speak to the various organisations that might work with um, round adoption, um, adoption UK, adoption fostering alliance, um, relationship Scotland, and I think we can maybe ask the clerks if there are any other relevant organisations that kind of are of an interest in this area that we would um, want to respond. And of course, through the petitions process as well, if people are reflecting on this and thinking, well, I actually have a view on this, then of course the committee would be interested. And that as well. You want to make one last point? Yeah, just in, in terms of what one of the objections, um, one of the things that people had talked about was the abuse of a system. So whether it would people would be um, be duped into adopting them um, for the transfer of inheritance rights, and that was one of the questions I posed to the Adoption Council of Canada about whether that actually had happened in Canada and they were quite clear that the abuse of the system wasn't happening because the because it's a court process and you have you're going in front of a judge the judge makes a judgment on whether there has been family life involved in this and I think certainly in, in our cases a judge could could make that quite confidently um, but I think if it was just a case of some young adult coming into an old wealthy person's life to be adopted um, then I think that a judge could make that that judgment quite clear but there are other ways that you could put in those protections as well and many different jurisdictions that have adult adoption already have different kinds of protections in the system. Okay. okay, thanks very much for that then. I think that has been a very useful starter. We will obviously correspond with the various organisations we agreed with. If there are others that you in reflection think may be worthwhile speaking to, then let the clerks know. And obviously once we have submissions and we're going back to this, you'll have an opportunity to provide a further submission at that stage. So with that, can I thank you very much for your attendance, both of you. I found that very interesting and we'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table.
Um, I want to miss my bit of paper in a minute. My apologies. The next new petition for consideration is Petition 1703 on access to broadband in rural Scotland. Members have a copy of the petition and a briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarks. The briefing states that the Scottish Government has made a commitment to deliver access to superfast broadband to all residential and business premises in Scotland by 2021 through its Reaching 100% programme. The petition before us today calls for this commitment to be met more quickly than 2021, raising concerns that many rural areas of Scotland are at an economic disadvantage due to the lack of access to superfund broadband. The petitioner highlights the village of Laid in North West Sutherland as an example of a rural area which has been negatively impacted by a lack of broadband service provision, particularly in relation to income that can be generated from tourism-related activities. Members will note that Audit Scotland published a report last week on the Scottish Government's progress in rolling out superfast broadband. The report stated that while the Government had met its target of providing access to fibre broadband to 95% of premises by December 2017, its more recent Reaching 100% programme will be more difficult to realise. A written submission was received this week and copies have been given to members. And can I welcome Rhoda Grant to the meeting for this um, petition. And I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for action. Um, I was really disappointed by the time scale of this um, whole delivery and as someone who represents a rural constituency, um, I get many uh, letters and emails um, about uh, the broadband delivery and whilst I, I I do think that there can be, um, for example, Highlands and Islands um, help from the Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, I know that the, um, the legislation has, isn't in place yet um, for the uh, South of Scotland Economic Partnership, but I know that obviously there's been a £10 million um, pound, uh, amount from the government to actually set up SOSEP, and I, I'm hoping that... Um, we can actually write to Professor Russell Griggs as well um, as high um, to ask um, you know, wh where we stand with regards to the rollout and if there is an intention to, uh, to, to put money eventually towards um, the, the, the digital rollout. Okay. Angus? Yeah, um, perhaps I should refer members to my register of interest of uh, on a non-domestic property in the Western Isles, which uh, uh, hopefully is expecting to get uh, um, a superfast broadband through the R100 scheme by September next year, uh, all, all being well. Um, but I, I certainly have a, a lot of sympathy for the, the petitioner, but you know it's clear that every effort has been made to, to, to meet the, the target by 2021. Um, it's an extremely challenging target, but uh, you know, we're all certainly hoping that that's, uh, that's going to be the case. Um, but I think we need to, to get further, you know, the current stance from the, the Scottish Government on, on where they are and how confident they are that the target will be met. Okay, Brian? I find, I find myself agreeing with uh, my colleague, Hank, <laughs> which, which is just, it's, it's troubling. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, th I think we've got the, the, the government have a target of 2021, and to arbitrarily then say we want it faster than that, without going into the practicalities of delivering it faster than that, um, you know, I, I, I find it, I, I find you know, I struggle with that. So, again, I, I'm, I would like to understand from the government's position where they are in terms of um, in their belief that they can deliver against the target in the first instance mm -hmm. before we start trying to squeeze that target mm -hmm. faster than that. I suppose for particular communities, if there's a, a sense that while the target might be getting pursued, they are not going to be any better off in 2021 with direct consequence for um, business and particular tourism trade. I mean, the examples that are given of people not staying in particular areas because they wouldn't have access to broadband while they were there. I know even in an urban setting, in my own constituency, I dealt with cases where people were going to relocate their business because they were dealing with international companies and they couldn't download or upload quickly enough because of the support they had. So I don't think there's any 
overstate the significance yeah. of it now for business. I wonder if we can maybe take Rhoda in at this point, who presumably will have had representation since in terms of her constituents. Yes, I, I've been in touch with the constituents who have put in this petition. Um, I think there are a number of issues, and I hear what the committee is saying about the targets and when, when that's going to happen. I mean, Leed is on the north coast. It's very remote. It's hard to get to. Um, so broadband would be a game changer for them. It would, you know, and so I think there are a number of things we can do with regards to the Scottish government. You know, when they're looking at R100, will they give some priority to communities where it will be a game changer for them? communities that are remote from services and it would boost their access to services that it, it would boost tourism but it would also boost work because it's a beautiful place to stay if you can only find work to do so I think that's one issue I think what's doubly frustrating for this community is that there's fibre running through it mm. you know this is the, the craziness it's, it's running past their door and they can't get it it's so near and yet so far so um, I think it would be good if the committee would try and identify who that fibre belongs to does it belong to open reach does um, does Hi know who it belongs to, or does um, the Scottish government know who it belongs to? And I've been urging the Scottish government for years to map the fibre that is lying in Scotland at the minute. Much of it has been paid um, for by by public funds. You know, we, we've had Pathfinder, we've had Swan, we've had so many different paid for by government. Um, fibre being installed and every time a contract is relet that fibre be stays belonging to the person who put it in rather than the government. We need to get that back because it would save us a fortune if we utilised that. So that's something I think it would be good if the com committee would do and at the same time be able to identify who owns this fibre and can it be utilised by the community. And that would be a very cheap option for them uh, just to be able to plug into that. So I would I would urge the committee to do that because I think it could make a difference to this community and there are mm -hmm. other communities mm -hmm. along the north coast that, I mean, there are communities everywhere, but I mean, you are very, the roads are poor, there are no alternative forms of transport, super fast broadband would would open up those communities. Is there a, um, a sense that in reaching the target, understandably the Scottish Government might be um, actually counterintuitively prioritising the areas that are easier to reach but are less needy because if you want to get to your target you get you, you take all the low hanging fruit first and do you think there's a sense in which the more distant communities, the more remote communities would benefit more um, are less likely to be part of a target, of an approach that is target driven We've seen that in, that in the past with the targets that are currently in place um, before R100, 95% for the rest of Scotland. In the Highlands and Islands, 70, I think it's 75%, or it may be 70, but could be as high as 75. So therefore, the target, we're already um, kind of facing an injustice where the areas that need it most are actually have a much lower target to reach. Okay. Are there any, I mean, I think we'd agreed as an issue um, would recognise that the Scottish Government has set targets, but whether there are unintended consequences of how that's playing out, and we need reassurance that even if that target is there, it's going to be met, um, and therefore the, the kind of concerns of communities being addressed. We would want to write to the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Islands and Islands, and I think Rachel's point about the implications for that part of the world about what the provision is going to be there would also be useful. Brian? And Rhoda Grant's point around actually mapping where the fibre, the fibre sits within. Who so would know that? Yeah. The Scottish government would know what they had paid for, what right. government have paid for. Okay. So you're looking. At, I mean, organisations like the the energy distribution companies have fibre in all their distribution lines. A network rail has fibre in all its rail lines. Um, so there are some big organised, the MOD has fibre um, and the Scottish Government obviously has laid fibre uh, to on a number of different locations for, for different purposes. So you might not get all of it, but even just through those 
few large organisations, you wouldn't map, so map we could, a lot. We could flag that up in the questions that we raised, and it'll be in, it'll be in the official report as well that they might want to reflect on. So I think we are agreed, um, as suggested, that we write to the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, raise the issue, the issues highlighted by Rhoda Grant and by Rachel Hamilton around specifics around the Highlands and Islands and uh, South of Scotland as well. And we would look forward to a response from those organisations about the concerns that have been highlighted by the petitioner and thank the petitioner for raising this with us. So if that's agreed, thank you, Rhoda, for your thank attendance. You. If we can move on to the final new petition for consideration today, which is petition 1704 on improved targets and outcomes for autistic people in Scotland by Duncan McGilvery. Members have a copy of the petition and the briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarks. Members will note the petitioner refers to a delay in the processing of this petition. As we are aware, the Public Petitions Committee has a high volume of new and continued petitions to consider, and this can result in delays to the petitions process, which can feel frustrating for petitioners, and we do understand that concern. So, but while we recognise and understand this frustration, I hope the petitioner, and indeed all petitioners, are reassured that we value all petitions we receive and the importance of giving these petitions due consideration. Turning to the petition itself, the petitioner is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ensure that an agenda of real and meaningful change for autistic people is pursued by introducing a number of targets and outcomes by 2021 as set out in our meeting papers. As our briefing explains, the Scottish Government published the Scottish Autism Strategy Outcomes and Priorities for the period 2018 to 21 in March this year. The publication updated the Scottish strategy for autism to focus on specific priorities for the next three years. The petitioner is of the view that this document fails to commit to, quote, to real, meaningful and measurable improvement for autistic people in Scotland and that they have been subjected to yet more vague and largely meaningless rhetoric. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. I should say that I attended um, the launch of a, a report which a combination of three charities brought, which was Scottish Autism, National Autistic Society and Children in Scotland, who had brought together really compelling evidence around the experience of families, particularly for young people being excluded from school, either informally, illegally, um, or being on short-term timetables, or indeed the petition from Beth Morrison that this Petitions Committee has dealt with before about inappropriate restraint. And I think there's a lot in that report which probably chimes with the petitioner's sense that there's a lot of discussion around support for people with autism, support for children in the education system for autism, but there's a gap between that and what the lived experience of these young people is. So I suppose the question will be, will be the targets identified by the petitioner, are they the appropriate ones? And um, I think we should be asking the Scottish Government to reflect on his view, the petitioner's view, that there's a gap between what's been said and what's been done. Brian? Yeah. Um, I've got a very specific interest in, in this, um, in that uh, I'm working with uh, some constituents having issues in, in this particular area. And one of the things of being uh, a, a list uh, MSP um, is that you work across several uh, different councils. And what strikes me is that there's a huge disparity mm. in the way that, that, that councils approach uh, uh, the sort of education uh, of, of uh, issues around autism, around dyslexia, around dyspraxia. Um, and uh, for me, that, that's something that, that I would be delighted to be able to get into and to explore is why, why that is the case, why you can live in one. I mean, I have, I have constituents who have moved house from one, like 10 miles down the road so they can get a different kind of support package put in place uh, for the child within school. So that that's without question uh, for me a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed and we need to explore if we can within this, this particular uh, petition. Okay. Angus? Um, no, no comment, Camina. Okay. <coughs> I, I, in terms of what the petitioner says about the right to an assessment, um, this thing about a child in mainstream school, and this was something again came out very powerfully from the, the event I was at, the launch I was at, that young people in mainstream school with a, who've been diagnosed with autism, is the support identified and then does the support actually exist? 
there was also highlighted whether it's a presumption, presumption in favour of mainstream may mean that young people have to go through mainstream in order then to ask spe access specialist provision later, and that sense of having to fail first before you get to the appropriate place. Um, but and it's quite interesting, again, the petitioner talks about an Autism Act um, enshrining specific rights and services for autistic people, because one of the things that certainly the parents who spoke at the, at the, um, at the launch, they talked about very simple, small things that could be done in the school system. To, it doesn't all have to be hugely expensive. Simple things that, um, and we had this again from Beth Morrison around um, her particular petition on restraint. There are things you can do to avoid the crisis where you then have to deal with that. Um, so I think there are there's huge amounts there that we could usefully um, look at. Um, I think St. Bright's the Scottish Government COSLA, but it might actually be interesting to speak to individual local authorities mm -hmm. what the different approaches are um, and to the relevant, I think, children's organisations and organisations that support people with autism. Are there any other suggestions? Well, I Rachel? Think, I think we need to take on board what the petitioner has asked, which, um, which is over and above the... He believes that the Scottish um, strategy for um, autism strategy doesn't go far enough to actually be meaningful um, or have measurable outcomes. So I think Brian's absolutely right that we need to establish um, what the local authorities are doing because um, the petitioner also says that there's inconsistencies and um, unacceptable delays in waiting times. So, um, I mean, it's quite soon to work out what the um, outcome of the autism strategy will be, but we must, um, I suppose, um, imprint on the government's mind that that is what people are looking for to make measurable difference for people with yeah. autism. Yeah, absolutely. Did you, did you mention teaching, teaching unions? No, I think that would, perhaps teaching unions and staff, um, unions representing staff who are not yeah. teachers within the school setting, because very often, I mean, what is the support given in, in initial teacher education that, that teachers know properly, strategies for supporting a young person with autism, what are the, the training needs of people who are maybe classroom assistants or additional support needs staff that are able to um, support young people? We'd be interested in their views as well, I think. Okay. Okay, in that case, I think there's quite a substantial amount of work to be done in that and establishing just um, the extent to which the strategy uh, is meeting needs and the aspiration of those who want to see more support with for people with autism. Um, and again, want to thank the petitioner for submitting the petition and there will be further opportunities for us to discuss this once we've had the submissions returned. So with that, can I um, close the meeting and move into private session?